I'm going to start this video off with the fact that graphics pricing is really cuckoo bananas at the moment. I bought this GTX 970 about a year ago for $120 off eBay. And although it's a Founders Edition, meaning that overclocking headroom is pretty limited, this specific SKU is significantly more expensive than other 970 flavors. However, that will also fluctuate depending on when you watch this video. But without any further ado, let's take a look at the NVIDIA GeForce GTX 970 and check up on Maxwell 2.0 in 2021. Alright, so to begin our look at the GTX 970, let's take a look under the hood and examine the specs of the GM204 chip we're being presented. Rocking 1664 Maxwell 2.0 CUDA cores divided into 13 SMs, this chip, while relatively efficient for the time, it's starting to show its age thanks to the lack of FinFET transistors, along with the overall drawbacks you'd expect with a card that's a few generations old. Compared to Pascal, Maxwell 2.0 is actually pretty similar in core layout, but unlike its successor, Maxwell is clocked much lower, only reaching 1178MHz as boost clock on this Founders Edition. Though overclocking is an option, but will vary depending on the quality of your silicon. The particular card I've got here hit around 1200MHz pretty consistently, but as my gaming sessions went on the clocks began to drop. Now let's dig into the topic I'm sure many of you are waiting for, and that's the weird memory configuration. While this card is advertised as having 4 gigs of GDDR5, Nvidia actually made a design decision similar to that of what Microsoft made with the new Xboxes, and partitioned 512 megabytes of the overall block to run on a much more restrictive bus width. Only 3.5 gigs are actually running on a 224-bit interface, with the remainder running on a 32-bit one instead. This slashes the memory bandwidth for the final eighth of the memory capacity, meaning that once usage hits about 3 gigs, access times and transfer rates will start to plummet. Now, unless you're a tech nerd, you're actually probably not going to notice this all that much, but either way the fact still stands. You still have 4 gigs of addressable memory, so it's not false advertising or anything, but it's a fishy quirk of product segmentation introduced by Nvidia. Power for the card is also reasonable by 2021 standards, with the TDP being rated at 150 watts and requiring two 6-pin power connectors to get the card running. I ran it off a Molex to PCI 6-pin and it ran perfectly fine, it just looked kinda janky and very yellow. Jokes aside though, a 500 watt power supply should be more than enough to power this card, and you'd be able to get by with a 430 watt which is what I used for this review. This ties into heat output, and although you won't be disappointed by the performance, it kicks out a nice amount of heat after gaming for an hour or two, and depending on how hot it got, the sound fluctuated accordingly, getting noticeably loud after about a half hour of heavy gaming. This could obviously be solved by buying a third party model with a larger heatsink, or even doing a mod like I've got on my 1080. It's an extra $70 to get the maximum clocks out of your chip and I know these cards are infamous for being overclockable into the 980's performance range. I won't be doing that in this particular video, however it might be something worth exploring in a future video. But with specs out of the way, let's get into the performance, and take a look at how it performs in modern games, but also compare its performance to a couple cards I had on hand. Alright, let's begin with an overview of our system we'll be throwing our cards into. Meet my i7-9700K machine, an 8-core behemoth socketed in my new Z390 A Pro motherboard. Clocks were set to turbo all core to 5GHz and will be more than enough to power our cards at 1080p high settings. 32 gigs of DDR4 was also used, along with running all of our games off of my Samsung 860 QVO, to help eliminate any bottlenecks in our memory systems. The cards we'll be comparing today are the GTX 1070, which is actually a pretty good comparison as it's the generational successor, and then my 1080, which has a water cooler strapped on just to provide some context as to how this would perform when compared to newer, much more powerful offerings. But without any further ado, let's get into this. Apex Legends performed overall very well on the GTX 970, and although it would make a great match for playing this game at 1080p, Keep in mind that the game also includes a dynamic resolution scaler, meaning your performance can be locked at almost all times, 
And this just proves you'd be getting maximum image quality despite the lack of power when compared to our beefier comparisons. Arc, like in our last review, ran pretty poorly, and with the high settings, that crippled our 970, bringing the average down to just 46. It's still technically playable, but it's not optimal, and a lot of this can be resolved through lowering the settings. The 970 though breezed through Battlefield 1, similarly to Apex, and unlike Arc, the card was able to hold its own with a relatively consistent level of performance, with no gameplay halting stutters or sudden frame dips. Both Black Ops games we tested today performed pretty similarly when looking at the overall percentage differences between the cards. However, Black Ops Cold War was much more demanding on the 970, dragging to an average of 58%, while the 1070 was able to average 79. I also noticed Cold War frames would suddenly drop when sprites filled up the screen, and I suspect the game is just struggling on all our cards, as it felt almost unplayable without V-Sync due to micro stutters. The infamous Crisis actually showed a little trend on all our cards, with the minimum frame rates being in the single digits on all of them. But nevertheless, the 970 performed better than expected, pulling a solid 52 FPS average over our 10 minute gameplay session. CSGO was also beyond playable, pulling an average of 195 FPS. Our minimum shows our frame rate never dipped below 60 FPS during our session, leaving me open to recommending the 970 as a card for esports titles. Doom Eternal showed our 970 who's boss, bringing the average down to just 71, and our minimum down to 45. Keep in mind though that the high settings in this game is equivalent to most other games' medium settings, so that may have something to do with the performance we saw. Either way, it was beyond playable and I'd happily play this game on a 970. Our 970 continues its strong performance streak, carrying it into Far Cry 5, showing an average and minimum that paints a performance profile that's very playable, and kills any last-gen console experience with its raw frame rates no matter the situation on screen. GTA 5, like Far Cry 5, performed very well, continuing into PUBG and Warzone, which all performed so well that it's easy to recommend this card if you're looking to get in on the Battle Royale craze. Overall, the GTX 970 has impressed me. Even though I didn't get to experiment more with this card in preparation for this video, the data collected paints a pretty rosy picture of the card that many remember pretty fondly. I honestly went into this thinking that it would be another run-of-the-mill budget card, but I was pleasantly surprised. Now as for if you should buy one, it's hard to say right now. With the crazy graphics pricing that's going on, it's not worth spending $200 plus on one of these. However, once prices come back down, I can see this card being an easy recommendation for about $100. Just give it some time and it'll be back down, but in the meantime, or if you're watching this once prices have come down, the GTX 970 is an impressive little piece of engineering. And although its power consumption figures are a bit high and its technology is lagging behind, for around the $120 I paid for this card, it's a total steal, and I'm excited to take another look at this card down the road and see how it holds up as we enter a new generation.